starts right now. Is that right, Ben? Uh, it is, as far as I know, Brett, if they'll let me. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Fox News Primetime. I'm Ben Domenech. Well, so that is that. Now we must dismantle the tree, putting the decorations back into their cardboard boxes, some have got broken, and carrying them up to the attic. The holly and the mistletoe must be taken down and burnt, and the children got ready for school. There are enough leftovers to do warmed up for the rest of the week. Not that we have much appetite, having drunk such a lot, stayed up so late, attempted quite unsuccessfully to love all of our relatives, and in general, grossly overestimated our powers. I hope you all had a Merry Christmas, and I wish you a Happy New Year in 2022. But before we turn the page on the year of our Lord 2021, it is time in this closing week to take stock of all that we learned this year, the frauds that were exposed, the evils we learned to hate, and the truths we woke up to about who we are and who we hope to be. Tonight and in the coming days, I'll be talking with some very wise and knowledgeable people who are reckoning with the lessons of a year of chaos and crime, a year that began with a promise that now we could return to normal and ended with the horrifying possibility that this, all of this terrible this, is normal now. The images of 2021 that will stick in our minds are many. The footage of brutal criminality in American cities taking place in broad daylight. Our fellow citizens arrested not because they stole or ransacked, but because they tried to buy a burger without showing their papers. The image of Afghans dropping through the sky as they clung desperately to American planes. Of mounted border patrol accused by this pathetic White House of racism and whipping, all for the crime of simply attempting to do their job. And parents hauled away in handcuffs for having the audacity to demand that school board members do their jobs and protect our children from abusive ideologies. And then there was the contrast between a scene of chaos at the Capitol as American citizens expressed their fury. These Americans, even the ones who never went into the Capitol, are branded terrorists, and Congress set up an unconstitutional committee to punish all Republicans as such. Meanwhile, actual terrorist attacks in places like Waukesha, Wisconsin, disappeared from the headlines because they were inconvenient to the narrative. It was a year when court cases were at the center of the national discussion. Kyle Rittenhouse, Derek Chauvin, Jesse Smollett, Ghislaine Maxwell. But for the results of the biggest cases, we'll have to wait till next year, when the Supreme Court will weigh in on Joe Biden's unconstitutional vaccine mandate and decide whether, despite the long-standing dominant legal regime of infant murder, the question of abortion will finally be returned to the people. It was a year when the richest and most powerful men in the world, no longer content to simply control what information we see, made themselves the arbitrary arbiters of which politicians could speak, which companies could sell their products, and which businesses would be permitted to survive. To me, three of the most important stories of 2021 were the war between parents and school systems, the malign influence of communist China on the West, our economy and culture, and the increased divide between elites and the people in numerous areas of life, rules for one class, but not for the other. The iconic image of 2021 may be Jeff Bezos celebrating shooting people off into space, while Amazon bans negative reviews of Xi Jinping's book as tornadoes rip through their warehouses and kill abandoned workers. But it's okay. Jeff's Washington Post says democracy dies in darkness. These stories intersect and overlap in myriad ways. One area where we see all three brought to bear is in some of America's greatest cities. Beholden to the powerful teachers' union interests, our cities utterly abandon those children whose families couldn't afford private schools and tutors. Falling prey last year to the political benefits of supporting defunding the police, Democrat politicians now face historic crime waves. Giving in to the leftist argument that compassion requires us to tolerate permanent tent encampments, cities effectively abandoned our fellow Americans to poison themselves with Chinese chemicals mixed in Mexican labs. What all these misguided and malevolent policies have in common is that they are sold to the people under a false narrative of tolerance, kindness, and love. As C.S. Lewis wrote in The Problem of Pain, when kindness is separated from the other elements of love, it involves a certain fundamental indifference to its object, even something like contempt of it. Or in mere Christianity, those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. 
As William Vogley wrote in his 2014 book, The Pity Party, the liberals who create, perpetuate, defend, and expand social welfare programs are devoted to them less because they care about helping than because they care about caring. As long as the message is that you care, it doesn't matter that your policies ruin lives, destroy livelihoods, and make wreckage of great American cities. Beverly Hills will hire private security. The politicians will send their kids to private schools. When Nancy Pelosi officiates a wedding at the Palace of Fine Arts for the Getty heiress, she knows it will only happen once those troublesome homeless drug addicts are all chased off. The elites who know best in government, in academia, in corporations, in big tech, in media, they will stand lockstep with this misguided mission. Even when the windows crack, children leap from high rises and the addict in the gutter closes her eyes for the last time. Let 2022 be the year where we say enough, no more. When we demand more of our nation, our neighbors and ourselves, things cannot continue as they are. This is not the new normal. We refuse to let it be because we are awake and we will not sleep until the reckoning comes. Joining me now to react, the author of San Francisco, Michael Schellenberger, someone who has written extensively and eloquently about the crisis in a great American city. Michael, tell me a little bit about what has gone on and why so much of what we face in this problem of homelessness, addiction, and decay is driven in part by this motivation to actually help. Well, thanks for having me, Ben, and a terrific monologue. As you may know, I worked for George Soros's philanthropy over 20 years ago. When I was doing that work, we were worried about mass incarceration. We wanted to see more rehabilitation of street addicts, of treatment for the mentally ill. But what we've seen occur is progressive prosecutors letting people out without any consequence, without any probation, without drug testing, without rehab, without the psychiatric care that people need. We've seen homicides rise 30% in 2020. They've risen even more in 2021 in at least two thirds of American cities. At least 16 cities set a record for homicides this year. And the response from my former progressive allies has basically been one of crime denial, insisting that crime rates haven't gone up, um, even as we see the bodies piling up all across the country, 30 times more African-Americans killed by other civilians than killed by the police, and of course, eight times more African-Americans killed uh, than white Americans. And so if black lives really matter, we would see a re-embrace of the police. We would see an embrace of things like probation and drug testing, of psychiatry for the people suffering from drug addiction and mental illness. We haven't seen that. I share your hope for the new year, but I think it's going to take a really serious reckoning, at least on the part of the left. I, I think you're right about that, and it's going to take a long time. One of the things that I remember hearing so much from my many libertarian friends uh, was this idea that you could essentially go down a road of, of total decriminalization when it comes uh, to drugs and have uh, a utopian benefit from it almost. But that's not really an accurate reflection of what's going on in other nations around the world that have tried to take on uh, the drug problem in new and innovative ways. Tell me a little bit about the, the truth as it regards that de decriminalization process. Exactly. Well, when I got out of this work working for the Soros Foundation in 2000, and it's a story I tell in San Francisco, 17,000 Americans were dying from drug overdoses and poisonings. That's 21 years ago. This year, over 100,000 Americans will die from drug overdoses and poisonings. We were all badly misled. I went to Europe. I went to Amsterdam. I interviewed the head of Portugal's drug program, and I asked him what would happen if you did in Portugal what people do in San Francisco, in San Francisco, which is to use heroin openly, to smoke meth in public. And he said very clearly, you would be arrested, you would be brought to the police station, and if you had the amount, uh, over a certain amount, you would be tried for drug dealing. If you had less than that, you would be brought before a commission for the dissuasion of addiction. We don't do that in American cities. You described the Waukesha, uh, the suspected Waukesha killer, who ran over over 40 people, killed over six, killed at least six people. He had just run over his girlfriend with his car, and yet they let him out on bail for $1,000. There was no probation, there was no electronic monitoring. And so we were all misled into thinking that there would be some kind of 
care, some kind of uh, state involvement in monitoring uh, suspects and people uh, at high risk of, of harming others or themselves, and that simply didn't happen. So I think you're absolutely right. You see a kind of unholy alliance between radical libertarians on left and right to just really de downgrade felonies into misdemeanors and then to stop uh, stop enforcing the laws against everything from shoplifting to open-air drug use to public camping. Well, I think a big part of your book, and the reason it's so essential people read it, is that you're telling these hard truths that people don't really want to reckon with. It's, it's much easier to sort of uh, embrace the idea that your policy is one of sympathy, but that's not actually what it is if it doesn't get people in the direction that they need to go, in a direction away from dying from poison in the streets. Is there an argument that you've used as you've promoted your book and talked about it over the past couple of months uh, that you find really works with the people who just want to fall back into that that uh, motivation, uh, you know, even with good intentions, that ultimately does not do well for the people it is meant to serve? I think the place that I've found the greatest agreement, Ben, is on this issue of, the, of mental illness. People with schizophrenia, but also people with serious uh, methamphetamine or heroin or fentanyl addiction are mentally ill and they are not in control of their behaviors. There needs to be an intervention. And so many addicts who live on the street, who we euphemistically refer to as homeless, are people who have lost all their ties to their family because their addictions have led them to steal from family and friends, to quit working, to basically destroy themselves in public view. We have found greater agreement now, including among some moderates on the Democratic Party, San Francisco Mayor London Breed, uh, just a couple, just a week and a half ago, came out and said we need to have a crackdown on the open air drug dealing. I'm finding a remarkable number of people on the left that acknowledge that we do need some kind of intervention uh, with people that are destroying themselves in public view. Again, 100,000 drug deaths last year, two per day in San Francisco. So I do think we're finding some greater agreement. You know, our country is so great because we're founded on the principle of freedom, but freedom requires responsibility. And compassion also requires some amount of discipline. It requires the enforcing of the laws. So my hope is with you. I think that we are headed, we, I think we're coming out of this pandemic as a sort of a wake-up call that these incredible increase in homicides and drug deaths and crime are a chance for us to hit the reset button and try to find some agreement on things like universal psychiatry, shelter first, treatment first, and make housing a reward for good behavior rather than another entitlement. Michael Schellenberger, thank you so much. I think you're a critical part of making people wake up to these hard truths. Thanks, Ben. Great to be with you. Also here with me tonight is the founder and CEO of Project Hood Communities Development Corporation, Pastor Corey Brooks. He is spending 100 nights on a Chicago rooftop to help bring attention to the rampant violence plaguing his city. Pastor Brooks, I wanna thank you for joining me. Tell me a little bit about why you are doing what you're doing. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, I'm doing it uh, for 100 nights from February, from November the 20th to February 28th. Uh, to bring a much attention and awareness that I possibly can to the violence that's going on in Chicago, but also to raise as much money as we possibly can to build a center here on a block that's called O Block, named after a young man named O.D. Perry who was shot and killed in a gang. The gangs picked up his name and they started calling it O Block. We decided we're going to keep the O, but we're going to call it Opportunity Block, and we're going to build a center here uh, that can help transform the lives of people, not just a center like a YMCA, but a center that is really focused on transformation, teaching the trades and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it is astounding to me that what's gone on in Chicago over the past several years has not received the level of national attention that it deserves as being a challenge to our approach as it relates to dealing with problems within communities of, of crime, policing, uh, drug abuse and more. As you uh, understand it, what do you believe is, is the most essential thing that people who are not from Chicago ought to understand about what's going on there? Well, one is to tell of two cities. You have a city that is very beautiful, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. But secondly, you have a very violent city where you have these pockets of violence uh, that are spreading like cancer. And it's not just spreading from in our community, but it's spreading uh, to those beautiful pockets like Lakeshore Drive, the Magnificent Mile, 
and those areas are not being dealt with uh, properly. Uh, we even heard of citizens on the north side who are now going to buy armed security, pay armed security to protect uh, their, their their neighborhood. That's unfathomable in a, in, a, in America. We we have to do better. We can do better. Uh, tell me, just as a pastor, that this has been a period of such difficulty for those Americans who have uh, sought to worship together, for whom that's been a central part of the way that they lived prior to the pandemic. We've seen so many shutdowns that prevented them from worshiping and, and gathering together during it. Uh, what can be done in the wake of this pandemic to try to bring faith back to the center of American life? That's a wonderful question. We have to bring faith back to the center of it. Um, without God, we're all utterly lost. And I think what we're seeing in America, especially in these urban centers where I live, um, that people are lost, they're hopeless, they're frustrated. And we have to do everything we can. That's the reason why I'm on this roof for 100 days, doing everything I can to bring awareness to the situation, to also bring solutions. Uh, we have to get people to turn back to God. We have to get people in our community uh, to take responsibility for what's going on. And when we do that, hopefully uh, we can change the tide, turn the tide on the violence that we're experiencing every single day. And we can make our city uh, one of the most beautiful cities in the world collectively, not just parts of it, but all of it. And it's going to take all of us working together. And that's the reason why we need all the help we can get from people all across America to help us to do what we're trying to do. Uh, where can people go to uh, support your cause, Pastor Brooks? Thank you. People can go to projecthood.org, projecthood, that's H-O-D, H-O-O-D dot org, projecthood dot org. And we want to thank everyone for the tremendous support. And I thank Fox for giving us tremendous support and help us to solve the issues uh, that we're facing every single day in Chicago. Pastor Brooks, I love the city of Chicago. I've spent many, uh, many a winter visiting friends there. I encourage you to stay as warm as you possibly can on that rooftop. Uh, stay, stay well, thank and you. thank you for what you are doing. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. Happy New Year. Coming up, a new wave of mask mandates and school shutdowns have reared their ugly heads. But why? As the left continues to scare us all with more variant hysteria, the actual numbers are not so doom and gloom. While positive COVID cases are on the rise, hospitalizations and deaths are not. In fact, things are getting better, not worse. Data shows that at the beginning of September, the seven-day average for COVID hospitalizations was almost at 97,000. But fast forward the clock to today, that number has dropped substantially, with a seven-day average of 67,000 hospitalizations. And we're seeing a similar trend when it comes to deaths. This is all good news. There should be no more need for mandates and lockdowns. But clearly, none of this matters to the progressive power brokers of the left. Last week, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser announced she'd be reinstating the citywide indoor mask mandate through January. And at this very hour, members of Chicago's largest teachers union are deciding whether or not they'll go back to remote learning. Joining me now to react, Christopher Bedford, senior editor at The Federalist and Fox News medical contributor, Dr. Nicole Sapphire. Uh, Dr. Sapphire, I think that when I read all of these different numbers and statistics and when I look at the trend lines, I feel like I should feel good about them. And yet everything that I'm hearing from the media and particularly from these power brokers within these major American cities is still the same type of hysteria that I feel like I've been hearing for months on end. Who is out of base here? Am I wrong to feel like things are looking better? Well, undoubtedly, Ben, I can tell you that when you look at the media headlines and even some of the talking heads coming out of the administration, it would seem that we are in a perpetual state of hysteria and panic. But I can tell you by looking at global data, including that out of the United States, that when it comes to the latest variant Omicron, which is probably about 50 to 60 percent of cases right now in the United States, there are much less, there are much more mild symptoms being reported with this variant. Now, that doesn't mean that people aren't going to be hospitalized with COVID. COVID-19 anymore, but it, what it means is that the majority of people who do get the Omicron variant are going to have a more mild illness. This is we head into flu and cold season where we already see an uptick in hospitalizations. So it is important right now that one, that we look at the people being hospitalized, the people that are dying, but making sure that when we're reporting on these numbers, that it is that these people are being hospitalized from COVID-19 and not with COVID-19. If you look right now, New York City, you keep seeing headlines saying pediatric hospitalizations are up in New 
New York City with COVID-19? Well, yes, well, we are testing every individual that is coming into the hospital. And I can tell you, historically speaking, from the last 20 months, when it comes to pediatric hospitalizations, those are grossly inflated. So while it is creating a scare tactic and causing people to cancel their holiday plans and kind of shuttering children, keeping them in hold in home and even keeping schools saying they're going to go to remote learning again, that is not necessarily the case. And when it comes to healthy children, it does seem Omicron and COVID-19 in general is very mild in this population. So the fact that you have Chicago, which has one of the most failing public school districts across the country, <laughs> who's now saying that we're going to go to distance learning when we already know even the CDC acknowledges that distance learning is a complete detriment to our children. All that it is going to do is just further cause um, a failing education, socioeconomics for the future of these children. And Chicago should be ashamed at themselves that they are preemptively keeping these children out of school because I can tell you they were hurting pre-pandemic and right now those children are suffering with a one-third dropout rate of high school students in the poorly performing high schools and distance learning will only make that worse. Chris, tell me a little bit about what you've seen happen and play out in D.C. The joke among many was that uh, Mayor Bowser was going to reinstate the mask ban as soon as she had filled out her docket of uh, Christmas and holiday uh, parties for uh, the season. What's your perspective on what the city has done and the approach from Mayor Bowser? That's exactly what she's done. She's done that, and then they have the basically the most progressive vaccine mandate in the entire country, where children who are attending any of the schools, public or private or parochial, now have to get vaccinated if they're five years or older, despite zero science backing that. They're doing more restrictions on businesses, like vaccine mandates, all of these things which really don't apply to anything. They don't make any sense, and it makes you wonder, if you live in Chicago or New York or Boston or Washington, D.C., why would you report that you even have COVID? Why would you tell the state they're not going to do anything? Anything to help you. They're going to do things to hurt you. Or at the beginning of January, the D.C. public schools have already closed for two days for, quote, instructions on how to handle COVID as if we haven't had two years of this. You, you, since the first week of COVID, you can see the police officers working, the firemen working, sometimes the bartenders working, the trashmen working. The only people who don't want to work are the teachers. And none of us seems to be willing to actually try to help the students or protect people from COVID. These policies that go on and onward are just kind of a classic symptom of what you've talked a lot about about, and you've been hosting, Ben, of the left-wing religion, which is we have to make penance for our sins, but not us, you. You have to pay for your sins, not the teachers who, if you stocked like we did stock at the Peabody Elementary School, look at the teachers, they're out of bars during some of these strikes. Uh, not for them, but for you, your children, everyone else, the bartenders, the restaurant managers, those are the people who have to suffer for the sins that the, the left feels so acutely. It is so often the case that it is it's the others who must pay the price uh, for our sins as a gathered society. Uh, but for us, the elites, life can continue on. Thank you, Chris and Dr. Sapphire, for joining me tonight. Coming up, we are back tonight with a Fox News alert. NFL legend and Hall of Famer John Madden has died. Madden was a Super Bowl winning head coach with the Oakland Raiders in 1977, a legendary NFL broadcaster. Perhaps he is best known as the namesake for the best-selling Madden video game series. John Madden was 85 years old. His loss will be felt throughout the league. Madden was someone essential to my life growing up. I cannot imagine growing up on Sundays without listening to him and Pat Summerall. And I fondly remember the many times that I spent uh, warring with my, my brother and my friends uh, over the video game franchise he created. John Madden was one of a kind, and he will be greatly missed. Democrats and the media may have spent over four years screaming profanities at President Trump or giving him the finger or having celebrity elites like Kathy Griffin holding an effigy of the president's severed head. But now that Trump isn't in office, Democrats decided now is the time to be the party of civility, since something far worse is now here. I hope you guys have a wonderful Christmas as well. Oh, Merry thank Christmas, you. and let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. I <laughs> yeah. agree. If you ask the media elites, let's go, Brandon, isn't just a dig at the president of the United States. It's much more dangerous than that. The asymmetry of saying F you to a sitting president on a call in front of your four kids. Don't look past this. Don't look at this as a story about giving airtime to a MAGA guy.
This is the slow motion insurrection. Let's go Brandon isn't about what you feel about supply chain issues and gas. It is the cry of insurrectionists. It is the cry of people who want to violently take over this country and oppress anyone who is not like them. Seems like the media's new profound sense of civility is just another way to save their elites, like Joe Biden and Dr. Fauci, from rightful deserved scorn. Here now, host. to their elected officials that they're ignored. So yes, you can argue that it's disrespectful. Sure, it probably is. But it also speaks to something di deeper among the American people, something important that they feel left behind by their elected officials. Mm -hmm. You know, Vince, uh, there was something there that uh, uh, was said by the MSNBC contributor uh, that I think is, is pretty troubling. This this idea that, you know, uh, the this expression is in, in, is not driven by, you know, frustrations over the economy or frustrations with the policies of the Biden administration, that instead it represents some kind of, of creeping and, and, and virulent a attitude toward uh, the very republic that we inhabit as citizens. I find that to be completely insulting, uh, you know, on its face, but also it seems to me part of their denial process in saying that no one could actually think this because their small business has been ruined, because the Biden economic policies have set them back, because they see what inflation is doing uh, in their communities. And that to me is just, it's completely absurd. I had the same thought when I saw this. That guy saying that this was an act of violence and this is a, uh, the steps towards an insurrection. It is a harmless moment. That this guy, this guy was actually in this relation, this con, the conversation with the president of the United States. Uh, you know, he actually had a really nice conversation with him. I thought it was a little weird, actually, the tone shift at the end where he goes, "Let's go, Brandon." Uh, I, I think he just took his opportunity because he wanted to impress his buddies and his wife, who doesn't like Joe Biden, and convey what you're talking about that really, that really palpable frustration with the Biden administration. But the idea that on MSNBC, where they've created this fantasy world where Joe Biden can do no wrong, where nobody would be upset about out of control inflation. Nobody would be upset about the way we got out of Afghanistan and let people die in the process. Nobody would be upset about our collapsing southern border. No one would be upset about the state of COVID when we were promised that this virus would shut down. It's not possible for someone to criticize Biden unless they're captivated by a cult. This is a media distortion filter on display, and they're asking their audience to believe something that is just completely untrue. It's disgraceful, uh, but unfortunately, it's become routine. You know, Vince, I, I think that, uh, and Liz, I think that this is going to be something that we're only going to continue to see play out over the coming year, sadly, uh, because as as things continue to get worse for this administration, as the poll numbers get worse, as the midterm elections approach, they're going to have to double down on this idea that anybody who disputes what the White House is doing, anybody who disagrees with the policy agenda, that they actually have some deeper malevolent motive, as opposed to just being Americans who are awake to what's going on in the country. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Up next, meet the pastor who is standing up for the